promise that we have in Jesus Christ. He is our solid rock, and no matter how dark our days, when darkness seems to hide His face, we can rest on His unchanging grace. He will love us forever and ever. The solid rock, my hope is built. Sing with us. Here we go. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweet of spring, but holy wing on Jesus' name. On righteous God is on a stand, all other ground is sinking sand. time I sing that hymn, The Solid Rock, I can't help but think about the flip-flop principle. You know about that, don't you? When I was a young boy, my father was involved with a group of men in building a resort community near the place where we lived, and that involved building a lake where once there was just a creek, and as that lake was filling up, and my dad would be up there for hours and hours, one of the things I would do is wander along that 
creek bank and that river bank and just play around, mess around. And I began to learn what quicksand was. And what I learned is that there were places I would step when that mud would not want to let me go. And one day I stepped in some and it just kept one of my flip-flops and never, ever gave it back. And I learned when you get off solid rock and solid ground, you can lose some things. Well, that's what that hymn is reminding us. That Jesus Christ is the solid rock of our lives. And when we're in Christ, we are always secure. When we are in Christ, we will always have strength and joy. But when you get away from Christ, more caught up in the pace of your day than you are in your walk with the Savior, more distracted by the problems and hassles than you are reminded of the presence of God in your soul. When you get off that solid rock, you can lose a flip-flop, but you can lose even more than that. There's not a one of us who ever wakes up in the morning and says, today I want to be out of fellowship with God. We never start like that. But it happens when you get off the rock and into the quicksand. So as we come before the Lord in prayer, I'm going to ask my wife Rhonda if she would join me up here and lead us in a word of prayer. As we come before the Lord in prayer, oh, let's ask Him this day to anchor us firmly on that solid rock. Let's don't lose a flip-flop as we go through the day. Let's pray. Oh, Holy Father, we are so grateful for that solid rock that you are, that we can depend on. Father, we thank you so much for our saving faith in you. We thank you for the strength and the guidance that you give us each day, Father, for your protection. But, Father, we just thank you especially for the many ways that you call us into your ministry, into your work. Father, it's with great joy we accept that call you've placed on our lives. Father, and with great, great determination and faithfulness, we just commit to you again. That, that desire to remain on that solid rock so that we will always not only bring honor and glory to you, but that we will always be able to bring you to a hurting, uh, needing world. Father, we love you, and we just thank you for your presence with us this morning. It's in your dear and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, before you sit down, turn to somebody next to you and just remind them, if you don't rock, you will flop. All right, let's do that. <laughs> if you don't rock, you will flop, darling. Thank you so very much. We are so delighted to have you here in Level Chapel for a very special day, a a time of worship and a very special kickoff for us as well. Many years ago, about 1975, and for some of you that's ancient history, but in 1975, Dr. Landrum P. Level II, our chapel speaker yesterday, came to be president. His wife, Joanne, first lady of our campus, and one of the very first things Mrs. Level did was to start a course of training for student wives, offering one night a week a class free of charge, no cost at all to the seminary, and free child care in the preschool center to enable wives to get some biblical training and background so that they would be equipped for ministry alongside their husbands. That foray into the care and nurture of our student wives, which has always been a passion of Mrs. Level, grew and blossomed into a women's ministry program that is now taking place not only with our student wives classes still offered every semester in eight-week terms, two eight-week courses each semester, every Tuesday night, free of charge, free child care for preschool children. It's blossomed also into a certificate program, into a bachelor's program major, a master's program major. We even have a D-men student in women's ministry now as we are doing everything that we can to equip the women of the church. Southern Baptists did something very historic when they met this last year and affirmed a revision to Baptist faith and message. They made two historic statements that Baptists have always believed, but we have never really put in print and publicly affirmed before as a body. And one of those was to say that gender is a part of the goodness of God's creation. It is therefore as good to be a woman as it is to be a man. And Baptists affirm that in the eyes of God there is no male nor female, that He created us all as His children. And I was quite proud of that statement. And there is a second statement made in that Baptist Faith and Message revision, is that God does gift and call women for service in the church. 
In recognition of that, the six Southern Baptist seminaries sponsor each year a consultation on women's ministry. It goes from campus to campus, and every six years it comes to the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. So this is our year to host the Women's Leadership Consultation. Today there will be ladies from all over our nation coming to our campus to be a part of this Women's Leadership Consultation, doing active training and brainstorming and networking on effective ways to mobilize women to reach ministry in the church churches of our Southern Baptist Convention. The lead event for that, the kickoff event, happens tonight. We'll be having a women's rally. Uh, it'll be a wonderful time. Rhonda will say more about that, but let me just say a word to you guys. You need to be sure that your wives come to the rally tonight. They will be touched, and they will be moved. Trust me, it'll be worth your taking care of the kids. It'll be worth you filling in and washing up the dishes after supper. If you get your wife here to that event, and we'll look forward to seeing all those wives here tonight. I'll be here. We're going to have a great time in the Lord together. And I'm going to ask Rhonda if she would introduce our chapel program today and tell us a little bit more about the rally tonight. Well, thank you so much, Sweetie. I'd love to do that. And it is exciting for the seminary here, to. He calls me gorgeous. I call him Sweetie. Uh, <laughs> just wanted you to know that. But uh, it is a joy for our campus to host our annual Women's Leadership Consultation. And before that particular meeting, we have the privilege of hosting a group that is called the Seminary Women's Network. And I want to introduce those special guests to us. But I, too, wanted to reinforce the importance of tonight's Women's Rally. Ladies, please be there. Husbands, make sure you send your wives. It's going to be a wonderful time of fellowship here in Level Chapel. It will be open to the community to kick off our event as we have the privilege of enjoying praise and worship led by the Franklin Avenue Women's Praise Team. The place is going to rock, I think. And then we're going to hear a powerful testimony from Sally Ann Roberts, who's a local TV spokes uh, anchor woman uh, with WWL TV. And then we're going to hear testimonies and then a wonderful message about prayer from Fern Nichols, who is also our chapel guest today. Day. So I do encourage you to be here. Don't miss out on something that is right here on our own campus, a time of real inspiration. But let me tell you this, ladies, listen up. After the rally tonight, we're going to have a midnight madness sale. My husband can't believe it. But the bookstore and Cafe New Orleans are going to be hosting for us right after the rally a midnight madness sale where the, the bookstore is going to be open till 1030 tonight for guests who are coming. The coffee shop, there's some of our ladies here on campus that are going to be doing coffee house music music for us, and then we're going to have autographings by our authors that are here for the consultation. It'll be a lot of fun. So we hope you'll join us tonight, and starting tomorrow through tomorrow night and Saturday morning, our campus will be hosting this Women's Leadership Consultation. So if you see a lady looking around wondering where she's going tomorrow, would you please point her in the direction of the cafeteria where we'll be meeting all day, and we appreciate that. I do want to take this opportunity to recognize some of our special guests who are already here this morning. These are ladies who have been meeting yesterday afternoon through today as a seminary women's network, women who come together with a mutual love for the Lord and a call to serve Him, especially to minister to women. And we're sharing what God's doing in our campuses, in our ministries, so that each other knows and together we can be stronger in equipping women to reach other women for the Lord. Well, we are privileged to have several of our seminaries represented here today, several of our sister seminaries. I want to introduce you to Mrs. Al Moeller, Mary Moeller, whose husband is president at Southern Seminary, so I am going to ask you all to stand. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> but I want you all to meet some of these women whose husbands you know about, and to, it's a way for you to commit to praying for them as they're involved in a ministry that is very significant in their own institutions. With Mary is Sharon Booker, and Sharon and her husband are both either on faculty or staff there giving leadership and sharing to the women's program there. It's also a privilege to have on our campus uh, Mrs. Paige Patterson. We heard from Paige earlier this week as he spoke in chapel, and Dorothy is with us as the president's wife of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. We have a representative from Golden Gate Seminary. She thinks, I think she gets the prize for flying the furthest, but Sharon Mellick is with us today. She gives leadership to the women's program at Golden Gate uh, Baptist Theological Seminary in California. And we're so pleased that these seminaries are represented here. And I want to mention to you, we also have another seminary represented, and that is Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Mrs. Ken Hemphill has been here, but I'd ask you to pray for her this morning. She's in the emergency room right now. She awoke this morning with severe abdominal pain, and so bang pounds, and uh, Susie Hawkins
Hawkins have gone with her to the emergency room, and we're anxiously awaiting a report on how she is doing. But Paula has been here for much of our meeting. With her is Susie Hawkins, whose husband is Ms. Uh, Dr. O.S. Hawkins, and he is president of our annuity board. So you can see that we have our seminaries and other agencies well represented. I also want to make sure that you meet other ladies who, through our SBC agencies, give leadership to women's programs. And we are so grateful for the camaraderie and the teamwork that we have developed that helps us to do the Lord's work in a more powerful way. Let me introduce you to Chris Adams. Chris Adams is our Women's Enrichment Ministry uh, Consultant with LifeWay in Nashville, and they produce so many materials and resources for us as well as leadership and networking. And then Jay Martin. Please meet Jay Martin, who is Women's Evangelism Coordinator with the North American Mission Board. Again, her focus and heart is helping women to be more equipped to share their faith with others. And we're so pleased today to have Janet Hoffman with us. Janet is here representing the WMU, the Women's Missionary Union in Birmingham. She's from North Louisiana. She's a pastor's wife, and she's one of our alumni, by the way. I think it was 1993 that Janet graduated from our seminary. And now Janet is serving as the National WMU President, and we are so proud of her and glad that she is here. Now, ladies, did I introduce everyone who was here with the seminary? And I'm going to get to Mrs. Level in just a minute, but that's with the Seminary Women's Network. That's great. Well, it's been a joy for us to work together and to share what God's been doing. And I did want to introduce a couple of other special guests. Chuck mentioned the groundwork that had been laid to allow us to build a wonderful women's program here at the New Orleans Baptist Seminary. And it's been such a joy to have Mrs. Level not only as a personal mentor for me, but then for her to get to come back to campus often. But Ms. Level is here. Come on, Ms. Level. Stand up, Joanne. We want to see you. She didn't get to stand the other day when Doc preached, but I want to just publicly thank her for all that she meant to me. I was in that first student wise class that Mrs. Level taught in the fall of 1975 and how God affected my life. She has been one of my greatest mentors. By the way, sitting next to her is probably my first mentor, my mom. So mother, would you stand up? This is Joyce Harrington. She's my mother. Some of you know her. She lives here in town, and she gets to participate in a lot of our activities. But isn't it wonderful to see how God brings into each of our lives people who can influence us for him? I want to introduce to the program, first of all, Dr. Farrington and ladies. Let me thank you all for leading us today, this ladies' ensemble. In a moment, we're going to hear a testimony from Stephanie Wright, one of our students and recent graduates, who's going to share with us what God's been doing in her life through others. And then it will be your privilege to hear a message from first. Fern Nichols. It was my joy about two years ago to meet personally Fern Nichols, but I had known of her ministry for years because she has a ministry that is committed to prayer. Fern is a wife and a mom who years ago in 1984 was so burdened for the needs of her children and their schools that the Lord laid on her heart the desire to start a ministry that focuses moms on praying for their children and their schools. So Moms in Touch International was birthed in 1984. She's been giving leadership to that as its founder and president since that time. Most importantly, helping all of us to know how important it is to pray, to pray scripturally, to pray specifically. So she's going to speak with us this morning. She's speaking tonight and again tomorrow for one of our sessions and our consultation as well as leading workshops. And I know that you will hear the Lord speak to you directly as she shares today. So again, thanks for being here. And Dr. Becky Lombard, thanks for leading our worship. We appreciate that. Good morning. In our efforts to pray, it is easy for us to be defeated right at the onset because we have been taught and everything in the universe is already set and so things cannot be changed. And if things cannot be changed, why pray? Some of the things that God has laid on my heart as I thought about what to share this morning, um, Dr. Kelly told me that I could share something about mentoring being the theme of, of some of the leadership consultation that will go on this weekend, or I could share about prayer um, being what Fern would share about this morning. And God, as I prayed, God laid some things on my heart about prayer, recalled, brought some things back to my mind that... He has taught me previously in my life, and um, I just wanted to share a couple of those with you this morning. Um, 
And back in college, I used to take mission trips every spring break when we went to Mexico. And um, we take, now they're taking about 250 people. We spread out into different teams. And the team that I was on had about 10 people. We went down to an area of Mexico uh, far away from everyone else, out in the middle of nowhere. We weren't sure we were ever going to find where we were supposed to be. Um, we went to an area that was experiencing a drought. It had been over a year since it had rained there. Their primary livelihood were raising goats, and most of the people were having to move further and further away from their town, their families, to take the goats to where there was water at all at the base of the Rio Grande. And so we were there during this time, and the pastor that we were working with, you know, asked us, of course, to join with him and his and the people of his church in praying that it would rain. And this has been something they've been praying for a long time. And so we, of course, agreed to do that and pray very fervently with them the entire week that we were there. The last day that we were there, it rained. And all of the uh, all of the members of my team, all of us Americans, were out there dancing in the rain, um, you know, playing, just shouting, praising the Lord because he had answered our prayer that it was raining. And we just couldn't believe it. We were so excited. And as we looked, one of us um, made notice that the pastor and his people were standing um, at the door of the church. And they were standing there, and they had smiles on their face, but they were just, you know, relatively calm. And we thought, why in the world are you not as excited as we are that, that God's answered your prayer and that it's raining? And so we decided we would ask them about that. As we did, they said in so many words, basically, we knew that God was going to answer our prayer. It was a matter of time. Um, and in his timing, he would. Uh, we are excited that he did, but we are not in the least surprised. And at that moment, God taught me that that was how I needed to be praying. Um, it's hard for me sometimes when I pray. I pray things that I, in my box, um, you know, if God might not be able to accomplish, I will. And so it will happen. Um, <laughs> And so it's harder for me to pray God-sized things, as I call them. Um, it makes me vulnerable that way because God might not answer the way I want him to. And um, so it might not take place. And that's a little bit harder for me to do. But in, in thinking about and praying and what, what God wanted me to share this morning, he brought that story back to my mind and has made me remember that that's how I need to be praying to him. And even in the last couple of days, there have been things that have happened in my life that God has challenged me. Um, allowed me to be tested to remember what he's taught me and what I was going to share about this morning. And so I want to share with you as I close, um, one thing that we know when we pray, we can count on that God's going to answer us and that when we pray, change is going to take place. And so you need to be ready for that. It may or may not be the change that you envision, but I can promise you this, it's going to be better than what you have in mind. And God has been faithful and proved that over and over, just as we sang about this morning. Um, in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, it says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. That is a wonderful promise that we need to claim this morning. When we pray, we need to expect that God's going to answer that. And we need to be excited when he does, but not in the least surprised.
Jesus is here. The presence of God is in his place because the presence of God is in us. And uh, I've seen Jesus on so many faces this morning, and I just love it. I love the body of Christ. I've been so blessed to have been brought up in a Baptist church in Portland, Oregon. And uh, I've always loved the body. And what a privilege for me to be here with you today. But before I get started, a little icebreaker, maybe for me, not for you. Um, I'm not one that tells jokes, so I have to get my jokes off the Internet. So, to just kind of help you men out, you know, um, Valentine's Day is coming up. (laughs) And so for those who have little sweeties that you're not married to and those that are married to some sweeties, um, just just a little little thought here. Finding a bottle on the beach, Jake uncorks it and releases the genie. Ah, now you get three wishes, says the genie. Great, Jake replies. First, I want a billion dollars. Poof! There's a flash, and a paper with Swiss bank account number numbers appears in Jake's hand. Next, I want a nice oceanside house in Hawaii. Poof! Another flash. And he is holding the deeds to an oceanside property in Hawaii. Finally, Jake says, I want to be irresistible to women. Poof! There's another blinding flash. And Jake turns into a box of chocolates. So, men, if you want to be irresistible, just a little hint from Fern here. (laughs) I know that there have been great godly men and women who have graced this pulpit. And I am very humbled today to be standing before you. I stand before you as a sister in Christ who has been saved by grace. And grace alone. I stand before you today forgiven. And as um, I've come before you, um, or as I've thought about coming before you and what God would have me share, as I spent some time with him, I believe that he has placed some things upon my heart that if it touches one, It was worth all the time and the preparation and the prayer that I prayed for you today. But before I begin, I would like to pray to our Heavenly Father. O our Sovereign Lord, we acknowledge that you are the one and only God, creator of heaven and earth. And you want to speak to us. And I ask that you would truly hide me behind the cross. That Jesus Christ would be high and lifted up and exalted. Oh God, we know it's your Holy Spirit that is the teacher. I am just the empty vessel that I want you to fill so that your Holy Spirit can touch hearts this morning. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when we talk about prayer, we can say, oh, prayer leaps over barriers, stops at no distance, and balks at no obstacles. For it is in touch with the finite resources of heaven, God himself. We say there is unlimited power in prayer because God is unlimited in power. We say by prayer we can release his power. His plan, His comfort, His guidance. You know, we can release that power the moment we pray to our child sitting in the classroom, playing a sport, talking with a friend, or listening to a teacher. By prayer, I can reach my husband's heart, a pastor, a professor, a missionary serving the Lord on another continent continent or a city devastated by an earthquake. How? By coming to the throne of grace. In the now. In the now. 
the present tense power of God released because one of his little bride people will pray. Prayer is omnipotent. And we can say these things and actually believe these things and teach these things and not experience it and not pray. Uh, Ruth Graham said something I thought was pretty powerful. You know that uh, verse in John 17, 19, it says, For them, this is Jesus speaking, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. The Amplified says it this way, And so for their sake, Father, and on their behalf, I sanctify myself, dedicate myself, consecrate myself, that they may also be sanctified, dedicated, consecrated, and made holy in the truth. She said if she was praying for her son Franklin, if she was praying, oh, he'd love God with all his heart, that he'd be a man of prayer, that he'd love the Word of God, that he'd dwell in it, all of these things. It was like the Lord stopped her and said, Ruth, what about you? You know, you can't ask God to do something in the life of another when you're not doing it yourself. Well, we can. But you know what happens? It falls flat. You're either going to splash out truth onto somebody else because it's truth within you. The truth of how you live when you splash out onto another is going to, to, to be fresh living water on them. So today, of course, because God's doing things in my life about prayer, I want to encourage you to pray. Establish the discipline of prayer. It's the discipline. You pray when you feel like it. You pray when you don't. You pray when you feel dull and flat. And you pray when you don't. If we just prayed every time we felt like praying, oh my goodness, how much prayer would be going on? Be intentional. If anything today I want you to go away with, and my heart is this, is that you will establish a discipline of prayer and be intentional about it. Make a covenant with the Lord that daily, daily, daily you will be in His presence. Unhurried. Sometimes that is a real decision to be still because some of our minds are racing like you would not believe. There's so much to do and so little time to do it. But God is saying, will you just test and see that what I'm telling you in my command to pray, that I will just open up the windows of heaven and show you things that you would have not known otherwise. You know, um, it's a real discipline for me to walk every day. Um, I can get those tennis shoes on, tie them up good. But if I never leave the house, it does nothing for my body. If it did, I'd wear tennis shoes all the time. <laughs> you know, we can know Jesus, but unless we do Psalm 91. He, to, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide, shall rest under the shadow of all the mighty of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress and my God, in whom I trust. Even though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. My oldest son and his wife have just had. Their sixth miscarriage. My son is a father of six, and they're all in heaven. Not one of them was born. Were they in the secret place of the Most High, resting under the shadow of the Almighty? If they were not, they cannot say of their God, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God knows what He's doing, and it's in Him I will trust. You know, the verse, if my people... They're called by my name, will humble themselves and seek my face. There is a seeking, a wanting to know our God. My soul finds rest in God alone. In God alone. And yet I think one of the greatest ploys of Satan is to keep us so busy. Busy doing wonderful things. Godly things. 
but it's like there's an invisible line that if you cross that invisible line to powerful intercession, he knows then that he's defeated. So he keeps you busy, busy, busy. You have this to plan. You have this to study for. You know, it, it's amazing how our time can be eaten up. Oh, you know those. You, you've heard this about Martin Luther. He had so many things to do that day, he could only spend three hours in prayer. And we're going, what? What? What kind of heart is that? I want that kind of heart. Prayer is a growing thing. It's a process. It's a learning. It's not all of a sudden you do three hours. Or when uh, life is shaken by things that you have no control over, that you immediately run to the high tower of God where his names are. We are changed from glory to glory, a little bit at a time. And he's so patient, so patient with us. But we've got to start. We must start. Isn't it amazing sometimes when we go to prayer, it's always preparing for somebody else? Instead of just gleaning for yourself. I love this verse, Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God in the midst of you is mighty. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love, and he will rejoice over you with singing. Is this what happens in your quiet time? That you just know God is mighty in your midst as you're talking. You're talking to the most mighty of all mightiest, and he's your heavenly father. Oh, my dad, oh, he created heaven and earth. And that he takes great and delight in me. Did you ever say to yourself, God, I thank you for delighting in me? When I get an A on the test and when I get a D on the test, you still delight in me? Does he quiet you with his love? Do you just feel embraced by him and loved by him? Or if I've got 15 minutes to be with the Lord today and they go through our little whatevers, do you ever just take time to be cradled in his arm and let him tell you how much he loves you? He's got plans for you that he's going to prosper you. Do you know that he rejoices over you with singing? I mean, I just look out on you and I just see little rejoicings over each head. Just singing over you. He loves you so much. And we don't have time to hear it. I have four children from the ages of 31 to 20. And we were all around the table when they were in elementary, junior high, high school. It was so awesome when we have those dinner times, you know where nobody was in a hurry. You know, uh, when they got a little older and in sports, you know, it's like picking up what was off the table. Mom, I've got to go. Where are the keys to the car? i got to get to the, to the practice on time. Not a lot of fellowship. Yeah, a little time, a little something at the table, but not much because I had to be gone, had to do this, had to do that. And in, I, I love Revelation 3.20 because you see it's to the church. It's to me. Jesus is saying... And I'm knocking. Oh, how I want to come in and sup with you. I've got so much to tell you. You, you. you don't know what you're doing in this situation, and I've got the answer. Remember, I'm omniscient. But you, but you just can't seem to settle your little heart and your little mind down to hear what i got to tell If we could just linger over dessert. I had an awesome time at Kelly's last night. We lingered at the dinner table. It was so special. Nobody felt like they were in a hurry. This is how we are with God. He says, I want, I want to come in and I want to sup with you. I want to have dinner with you. When I put out the big spread of the Thanksgiving dinner, and nobody's in a hurry in my family, we sit around the table and we talk for hours. And I'm hearing what's happening in Troy's heart. And what Tricia thinks about this, and oh my goodness, the discussions they can have about the Calvinist and Arminian. I mean, we just go, and I just hear, I'm just sitting there basking in the love of the fact that they want to talk about the things of Jesus. But we're so much in a hurry. But we must be intentional. You're always going to be in a hurry, and you're always going to be busy. There is always going to be something to do. But Jesus is knocking. Can I come in now? Can I sup with you for a little while? I've got so much to tell you. I want to rejoice over you with singing. I want you to know how much I love you. You see, and that's where we get our passion. 
we get passionate about the things God gets is passionate about when we hear his heart. And I just want to share how that happened with me, with, uh, with, with my children, and how Moms in Touch got started. Yes, I was fortunate to be brought up in the church. And I had a praying mom. And we prayed, and she took us when we were real little on Wednesday night. And I remember just sitting there with my feet dangling in the pew. I don't remember one prayer that was said, but I knew something glorious was going on. Just that modeling. Prayed for my children all their life. But there was a time when those two oldest sons of mine went off to that junior high school that something happened. And I knew prayer was the answer. And I became so passionate about the fact that Satan was not going to have my boys. That they belonged to him. But I needed help. I, I, I knew that this was more than just one righteous woman dynamic in its power praying to God. I knew that there needed to be an army of moms. I knew that that united prayer, believing in the name of Jesus, was going to do great and mighty things in the lives of my boys, and Satan was not going to have them. And as, as that was my passion, what came out of that was I tell women, let's take seriously what Satan wants to do with this next generation of young people. And we must heed the words of Almighty God of how he feels about our children and the next generations. And I love to take this verse and use it as a Moms in Touch verse. You professors will forgive me. I'm posting women on the walls of every single school in this nation. And they're not going to be silent night or day. They're going to call out to God and they are going to give God no rest until our children are holy and walk with the Lord and are light into the world and that our schools will be light. Prevailing prayer. I say to the women, let's not be Ezekiel 22:30, When God looks for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not destroy it, and I found none. None. That's one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Are we weeping? Are we weeping over the ruins of the spiritual walls of our schools? Do I want revival in the school? Do I want the children and teachers coming to know Jesus? Do I desperately desire that our Christian children be strong in their faith and not ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Do I believe and want the Bible to be read and obeyed in our classrooms? Do I want the strongholds of disrespect, apathy, pornography, alcoholism, premarital sex, and abortion torn down? Yes. Why? Because that's God's heart. He's passionate. How do I keep that passion? By sharing it everywhere I go? No. I have to continue to keep it in the time alone before my Father. We want a passionate heart. What are you passionate about? I tell you, if you spend time with the Lord, you're going to get passionate. What are the things that have waned in your life? That at one time in your life you were passionate about it, but now it's just hum-ho, same-o, same-o. Oh, God wants to... To give you a passionate heart about the things that he's passionate about. He wants you to love the things that he loves and hate the things that he hates. So in 1984, God burdened my heart so deeply for the spiritual protection of my two oldest boys. Sending them into darkness every day. The surrogate mothers and fathers, the majority of them who did not know Jesus. The immorality, the vulgar language, the humanistic teaching, the drugs, premarital sex, it was everywhere on the campus, and I was devastated that I was sending them into these ruins. But as God ignited my passion for the boys, knowing that prayer was the answer, and God would hear and answer my prayer, then he gave me a vision. I didn't know it was a vision. He gave me a thought. But what can we do about it? And it was to unite moms together to pray. And he laid upon my heart one other mom. And I just called her up and I told her my heart. And I said, honey, when you come over to my house, it is not going to be any talking. We're going to start and end on time. There's no refreshments. We are going to war. We are going to fight for our children and their friends to come to know Jesus and those teachers to come to know Jesus. 
Today, we take every single name of every child in the schools where we have moms in touch and pray by name for their salvation. By name. Trisha's in college now. She's living with three unsaved uh, roommates. By name every day. Oh, Jesus, you love Liana. You love Kim and you love Jamie. May Jesus uh, reign in Trisha's life so that they will want to know the Jesus that she has. Who's crying out for these kids? Who's asking God by name for their salvation? So see, when we spend that time with Jesus, when we're unhurried and stuck with him, he's going to share his heart. And he's going to keep the passion alive with, within you. Mom's in Touch Now has been going for, for 16 years. And praise God, there are 30,000 Moms in Touch groups across this land. We still have a ways to go because there are 120,000 schools. Close to 200,000 moms who are intentional, who have set aside one hour a week to, to unite together with other moms, to pour out their hearts before the Father, lifting their hands up for the lives of their children. They made a decision. Now, some weeks do some of them miss? Yes, but they get back. Sometimes we get so discouraged. You have a wonderful, quiet time for a week, and then things go down. You say, oh, you know, and you kind of give up, and you go back to your life. Go back. Make the commitment. Make the commitment. If truly God's will is done here on earth, just as it is in heaven through prayer, then we've got to be praying. I wonder what would happen if the body of Christ really took this seriously. Pretty exciting thoughts. And I want to encourage you. As, I don't know how the Lord's going to lead your students and where he's going to take you. But I know this for sure. Keep having abiding days because you never know what God will tell you on one abiding day. See, I was just abiding with the Lord in my kitchen that day, talking about my kids off to school and, you know, how he takes one thought to another to another as you're talking out. You know, he's your father. You just talk back and forth. He's going to tell you to do something. You'd be obedient to it. And it could change your life forever. You see, service comes out of seeking, not the other way around. And we can kind of get that mixed up at times, I think. And, and I'm only sharing this with you passionately because these are the things that God is teaching me continually. Every day I get up and it's a decision if I'm going to spend time with the Father or not. I wish I could tell you that from now until the Lord takes me home, I'm going to have that hour every single morning from 5 to 6 o'clock in the morning. But every day it's a decision. God, help me to make the right decision. This one right decision. And so as God places you in other places, I don't know, maybe as a pastor or a youth director or e- even after seminary, he might want you to be a businessman. Oh, my goodness, salt and light in the business world. Now, is that an awesome thought, too? Thank you. <laughs> but wherever you are, you see, if your personal time with Jesus is real and alive, then whoever you touch, you can teach. And your greatest disciples are your children. And husbands, the greatest disciple is your wife. If you spend any time praying with her, be intentional. Oh, Arlie and I hit and miss it all our lives. But we keep coming back to it because we get busy. He's going one direction, I'm going the other. Don't give up. I want to encourage you as you... Step out and seek God for what he has for your life. That you keep the priorities right. Be intentional about it. God first. Seek first the kingdom of God. Do we really believe it? And all these things will be added. He promises he's not a God that he would lie nor the son of man that he would change his mind. He says, you seek me first, I'm gonna, everything else is going to be okay. But you just seek me first. Keep him first and your family second. Oh, the greatest disciples you have are your own children. How awesome that I was able to be a stay-at-home mom. I'm a mom at heart. Can you tell? <laughs> and even though I might have, sp- I was very careful when the kids were in school. Uh, the speaking engagements I took, uh, the time 
uh, that the ministry was demanding. But being at home, as soon as they walked through that door, I changed hat. I was mom. The cookies were on the table. I had a few red eyes as well. My, my third son played uh, football with quarterback. You think I was going to miss a game? <laughs> Absolutely not. So after the football game, wish me off to the airport and a few red eyes. In Ridgecrest, or at Ridgecrest, we had our 15th Moms in Touch anniversary, and my precious whole family was able to be there. And this football player, one of the moms came up to him and said, you know, it is so neat that you took time out to come support your mom this way. You know his answer to her was, and I never would have known this if she had not, this lady had not told me. He said, well, it is something I never thought I would even say no to or not even want to support her after all the times my mom has supported me. She never missed a game. He never told me that. It meant a lot to him. You know, it's kind of hard for high school kids to express themselves. But if you do what's right, if you do what's right, God will bless it. Keep your family second. Nurture it. Love those little people in your family. Build into them prayer. At the dinner table, the question of, how was your quiet time today, honey? What did God teach you? Did anybody see glimpses of God's glory today? We should expect to see glimpses of God's glory every single day. We should be expecting miracles. My goodness, when we think of all of the miracles in the New Testament, I mean, that was the majority of what Jesus did. He loved to touch. He loved to heal. He loved to help. And he wants to show you himself daily. Are we expecting it? Are we watching for it? So those times of, that you will have to teach others, take advantage of it, your own family first. And then I just want to quickly go through how we do it in Moms in Touch. We're just not a ministry that tells other women how to pray. We pray. If you would come visit us at our Moms in Touch headquarters, there are some things going on. But first I want to tell you, I can't tell my women, my staff, to pray if I don't pray. So my intentional... Determination, God help me covenant with him, is one hour every morning. And then you see when I had almost a three-hour plane ride to New Orleans, what a, what a quiet time. What a quiet time. Yeah, you can pick up other things to read. Oh, but what, who, what, what knowledge do you want to hear from anybody else besides God? Really, when you stop to think about it. You see, if you don't, have a goal. You aim at nothing. Get a goal out there. Think about it. And then be intentional about a half a day alone with the Lord or a day. I call my Poway Lake days. I live in Poway, Poway, California near San Diego. And uh, i got to be intentional about it. I've got to get it on the calendar. Boy, you and me, Jesus, today. And you know what I take? I take my Bible, a notebook, and myself and Jesus. Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to think about this resource that, you know, you've got to write and get going, or this program, or this, that, and the other thing. And that's all Jesus wants is just to step with you. And these days are incredible. Not that he won't tell you things about your ministry or even give you new strategies. This is what he did with me one day, the Poway Lake Day. Every school covered with prayer by the end of 2003. What a goal. This is a supernatural plan. I can't do it. You see... Getting out of the box, I cannot do this. This is going to be a total God thing. But boy, are we working hard. You put feet to your prayers too, right? It came out of that time. And what do, we, what do I do with my staff? I implement prayer as I lead to them. Every single day they're in my office, except when I'm not there like today, and my office manager does this, and we, we have a time of prayer from 9 o'clock to 9.45. A lot of things on our desk to do, absolutely, piles this high. But we're seeking God first. All the other things will be added. We've seen it over and over and over again. We literally had a man almost uh, walk off the streets, and it was the story is incredible. Of, of not his mom being a mom's in touch or anything, and comes in and hands us a check for forty thousand dollars. I mean, we pray about our finances. It's it, seek him first. 
Every day, they're in the office. We do an attribute of God. Focus on Him. And then we pray. Believing in the name of Jesus. And then every Tuesday, every Tuesday, for two hours, we pray. And that is also a day that's set aside for fasting and prayer. Partial fast, full fast, however the Lord leads each one of them. And then we have spontaneous prayers throughout the day. A decision, a problem comes up. We immediately stop and pray. God, what do we do about this? What we want to do is handle it ourselves because we've got gifts and talents and areas that, you know, we figure we can do it. Why not include God on every single thing, even in your little gift and talent that he gave you? Stop and pray. The immediate, spontaneous prayer has been fantastic in Moms in Touch as we serve him in this ministry. For our Moms in Touch retreats and rallies, the first committee, you named it, prayer committee. If there is no prayer committee and prayer has not preceded it, six months to a year before we come in, we don't do it. Because we know it's the Holy Spirit that changes lives. Not our great planning. Not our great speaking. Not our great anything. It's the Holy Spirit. You see, God's not going to give his glory to anybody else. Or he will use somebody else if we want to take the glory. So much more in my heart I'd love to share. Once I get going here, I can hardly stop myself, but I need to. I just want to close with a couple thoughts. Real prayer is something we learn. It's a learning process, but you've got to get started. You see, if he says, this is another promise. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you can ask whatever you want and it shall be done. And you're not going to ask amiss because you see, he's going to be abiding in you. You're going to be hearing his will. Abraham asked for Lot's life in his family. God answered. Elijah asked for rain. God answered. Jehoshaphat asked for deliverance. God answered. What are you asking? What do you want to see God do? What's your passion? My encouragement. Be intentional. Be disciplined. Get the tennis shoes on and get out the door. A little bit at a time. It's growing. It's a learning thing. Oh, how he wants to stop with you. How he wants to embrace you. How he wants to tell you the next steps. He wants to guide you. And then, pass it on. Teach it. Teach prayer. Is there anything more wonderful than to teach and prayer? We also have church-based moms and touch groups. I have a sheet over here if you're interested in how we are helping, I believe, the church having a more godly holy church by teaching those precious moms how to pray. It is amazing the testimonies we get back that this has been life-changing, these four steps of prayer that we teach, which I will be sharing in the consultation uh, time with the women. Thank you. You've been so attentive. I just had a sweet time of prayer for you this morning. He loves you so much. God has used this seminary in incredible ways. He's put godly men in leadership. You're so blessed. Never take a day for granted. Never take a song for granted. Keep your heart open and soft to hear your precious Heavenly Father want to speak to you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are the teacher today. I thank you that you're so patient with me. Sometimes I'm such a slow learner, but I'm so thankful I have such a compassionate, caring, patient Heavenly Father. And I'd ask that you would bless these precious people indeed, that your hand would be upon them. Oh, Father, enlarge their borders and protect them from the evil one. Oh, God, do supernatural things in this seminary because there are precious people in this seminary who are spending time with you and dare to trust. In Jesus' name, amen.